what we're going to do is have a 10 minutes a break between the uh, next speaker. Critique of Mellon's Chapter 17, The Fingerprint. Uh, I'm going to read through a prepared statement, uh, so bear with me, but we should have plenty of time to have an informal discussion after that. I want to start out with a quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I'm a fan of Sherlock Holmes, and in Studying Scarlet, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote, It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. When I read the parts of Joan Mellon's book, Faustian Bargains, regarding the fingerprints, I immediately realized that she is ignoring facts, misinterpreting evidence, taking liberties with, and misinterpreting the report of her certified latent print examiner, Robert J. Garrett. I consulted her about our 1997-98 Wallace fingerprint investigation, which I was involved in, uh, three months, for three months in the spring and summer of 2012. Um, she emailed me and uh, started asking me the usual questions. I've consulted several people on this. And um, we spent uh, three months emailing back and forth. Uh, she, she asked questions, I answered them. She asked the same questions again, I answered them again, simplifying. She asked again and again and again. I'd say about 12 times for each question. And I kept simplifying and trying to figure out why am I not getting through? Well, how can I? How can I simplify this further? Um, and um, so I noted some uh, biases and ignorance she had at the time. Uh, ignorance is excusable. I'm uh, willing to um, answer any questions anybody has about my research and my experience in this. Um, and um, I tried to overcome those uh, biases and ignorance. And I told her uh, in the first week, I recognized some bias and I told her, uh, uh, I want to warn you that uh, I sense some bias in what you're saying here. And others have now said, based on what they know about what she wrote in other parts of the book, that she stuck with some biases. So, um, after that, I reserved judgment uh, about her vague claims and the rumors circulating about her book over the years and waited for her published findings. Um, because I figured, well, you know, I'm going to wait until she publishes. Uh, saying you have proof is not proof. So, uh, and there was every opportunity. Uh, I think the book, I heard that the book was imminent to be published a year ago. And then I uh, started hearing rumors that uh, it had been delayed. And uh, it took another year for it to finally come out. And I figured, well, maybe she's reconsidering this stuff. So I, I did not respond to any of the rumors or any of the vague statements. Um, so I went over some of my general concerns and relevant facts in my speech in Alexandria, uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, two years ago, and in Dallas, I did the same speech uh, here in 2014. But now that Mellon has published and committed to her conclusions, 
I'm afraid I must raise some serious and disturbing questions about them. Six pages into chapter 17, The Fingerprint, where Mellon begins to give her details about J. Harrison's fingerprint investigation, the errors start piling up quickly. She claims there was, quote, a single fingerprint collected from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository on the day of the assassination that had never been identified, unquote, page 252. Yet, Warren Commission Exhibit 656, which she mentions at the end of the same paragraph, shows several unidentified latents. Also in that paragraph, Mellon gives a different location for box A, from which print 29, the relevant print here, had allegedly been lifted. But no source for this surprising claim. She gives no source for this surprising claim. Um, it's surprising because it contradicts Warren Commission Exhibit 641, volume 17, page 292, and the testimony of Sebastian F. Latona, supervisor of the FBI latent fingerprint section. Latona testified that box A was the top of three stacked boxes on which Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly rested his rifle in the alleged sniper's nest. Despite that known fact, Mellon claims box A was, quote, sitting at the edge of the entrance to the sixth floor, unquote. Then she begins to conflate two very different Wallace ten-finger print cards, inked print cards, by writing, quote, Harrison's plan to obtain Mac Wallace's fingerprint card from the Austin Department of Public Safety. Um, that's a fragment, uh, page 252. Followed by, quote, even with Harrison's contacts, the Austin Police Department, with the Austin Police Department, it was not easy for him to obtain Wallace and Prince. Jay Harrison, let me straighten you out on this. There's some confusion that she obviously still maintains here. Jay Harrison first obtained the Wallace card on file at the Austin Police Department. That is the one that was unusable. All ten prints were literally smudges. Uh, no lines at all, just filled in ovals. Jay rejected that Austin police prints immediately and only showed them to anyone, including me, for their absurdity. Jay then realized that the state police, the Texas Department of Public Safety, which we call the DPS, might also have Wallace's ink prints on file. It is that excellent quality, first generation, certified copy of the DPS prints that was used for all of the subsequent matches. I have the high resolution tips of both that certified copy of the DPS card and of the certified copies of the Warren Commission latents. The details of how and when we made those scans are in my task report shown in my 2014 slide presentation. I have sent those tips to several researchers over the years, including Jim D. Eugenio in 2009 and Joan Mellon in 2012. D. Eugenio ignored them, and Mellon conflated the DPS and APD ink pr prints, which resulted in her false claim that the prints were unusable. Her calling them the Austin prints, page 253, is, a, is inexact to the point of being misleading. APD, which is the Austin Municipal Police, and DPS, and the DPS State Headquarters are both in Austin, which is the state capital. Darby and Hoffmeister used only the DPS rolled prints, which were excellent quality. Not even the flat prints at the bottom of the DPS card are smears. Any reference to smears or smudges is a conflation of the actual smeared prints on the ridiculously unusable APD print card, uh, the DPS flat left little finger is obviously too light due to being too dry from a lack of ink, which is the opposite of an over-inked smear. It is important, therefore, to counter Mellon's misinformation and restore these proper document names. I put all of my tips of these documents recently in a Dropbox folder those images show the complete DPS card 
and the Warren Commission Exhibit 656, plus detailed images of both. I made them accessible to anyone with a link. I'll just contact me and I'll get you that link. Um, those images contain uh, no point markings, no initials, such as D-A-N, which you see on the ones Joan published, or signature of Darby, whose full name was Asa, A-S-A, Asa Nathan Darby. D-A-N stands for Darby, comma, Asa, Asa Nathan. They are the documents Darby used for comparison. In the images with Darby's marks and writing, such as what Mellon gave to Garrett for comparison, are subsequent copy generations and enlargements used by Darby as working and presentation charts and are therefore naturally distorted. Any suggestion that those marked charts were Darby's comparison documents is ignorant and absurd. Mellon repeatedly and wrongly refer refers to this one print found on the sixth floor that was compared to the Wallace Inked print provided to the Austin Police, quote, Austin Police, page 254, and even misnames it, quote, the Austin Police print, page 255. Mellon then writes, quote, concluding, oh, moving on, concluding that Hoffmeister had changed his mind out of fear, Jay forged ahead, unquote, page 256. Jay did that for good reason. Uh, he was visibly upset and angry with Hoffmeister when he told me that Hoffmeister told him that both he and his wife feared for their lives and his name, if his name were ever connected to his print identification. He insisted to Jay, this is what Jay told me, that his name never be used in connection with it. I respected that and never did reveal his name. I have always wondered why his name was revealed and what he thought about it if he had ever found out. Mellon then departs from the fingerprint to speculate about Wallace's whereabouts on the day of the assassination, page 257. She writes that she interviewed his son, Michael, who, quote, recalls that almost, almost certainly, Wallace was home for dinner. Now remember, this is the day of the Kennedy assassination. These are flash memories from that day. He was 15, I was seven. I have very good memories of that day. But he was almost certainly, uh, he recalls that almost certainly Wallace was home for dinner. Uh, he does not recall what uh, time uh, Wallace arrived on the night of November 22nd. Uh, but he, feel, he feels certain that he was there. He feels certain that he was there. My dad got off work uh, that afternoon. My dad worked at Collins Radio, which I've written about. He got off at like three in the afternoon. I didn't uh, find that out until I interviewed my mom later in adulthood. Um, but um, Michael says that uh, he was home for dinner. Putting aside Michael, he feels certain. He's almost sure that he was home for dinner. Putting aside Michael Wallace's uncertainty about the time and the fact that sunset was about six hours after the assassination in Anaheim, I want to make a very different, I want to ask a very different question about this interview. Why did Mellon go to the trouble of finding and interviewing Wallace's son, but never took the time to talk to Nathan Darby's son? A minister in Austin, before writing that Darby, quote, had perjured himself on his affidavit, unquote, page 261, when he swore he was certified. My friend Don Meredith, who Mellon quotes about other matters, is a neighbor of Pastor Steve Darby. She talked to him after Mark Mellon's book was published. In contrast to Michael's uncertainty and qualified statements, Steve, with whom his father lived, is at is and has always been absolutely certain that his father kept his certification up to date and was certified at the time he swore to it. Mellon wrote that Garrett's examination was blind, that Garrett wasn't told whose prints he was examining, page 258. Why then does Garrett's report call it the Warren Commission exhibit and the quote Wallace print? 
unquote. Page 280 to 283. Darby's affidavit does not name Wallace. Hoffmeister's fearful reversal of this match after learning its context in 1998 shows the necessity of the examiner remaining blind to the identity of the prince while reporting his findings. Uh, even if Mellon's re-examination of the Darby match had been blind, it was required to be double blind at least. In 2016, one need only Google, I mean, well, even back when he, she was contracting him back in uh, 2013. Uh, one need only Google Mellon to see her JFK assassination connection and then Google JFK assassination fingerprint to learn about the Darby match. Um, this lack of proper scientific blindness alone that invalidates the Mellon Garrett examination. In August, researcher Sandy Larson wrote on the education forum, um, Doug Caddy mentioned this yesterday and recommended that you read it and so do I. Um, he wrote, quote, did the Navy Give Mellon authentic, authentic fingerprints. Unquote. Larson pursued his question and discovered evidence that the Navy print Garrett used for comparison was not authentic. On October 5th, Larson wrote, I have studied the prints and have determined that there are a few subtle but crucial differences between the fingerprint Darby was given and the one Garrett was given. That's right, somebody altered the Navy print. He continues, I've also determined that Darby had to have been given pretty high quality photocopies because he could not have been, he could not have seen all 14 of his matches on that copy floating around the internet. He continues, and I now know, since I bought the book, that Garrett was given the low resolution copies of Darby's prints, the ones floating around the internet. The ones he said weren't good enough to read. Garrett has not seen what Darby had. Larson goes on to explain how he compared the Navy uh, prints to the low resolution Darby print and found differences between them. He then revealed, he then, re, he then reverted those changes on Garrett's Navy print back to what they were before the forger changed them. After reverting the changes, Larson said he found 11 of the Darby's 14 matches. Now let me tell you, Larson is not um, a fingerprint examiner. He, like me, has studied the issue and he has something very relevant to say a little later. I'll, I'll quote that. Um, he found 11 of Darby's 14 matches. You see, back when I originally got these prints and was helping uh, Barr and Jay uh, with the identification of them, I took the time, really at Barr's uh, insistence, Barr wanted me to be the, the guy on the team that troubleshot anything having to do with fingerprint science. So I had to bone up on it. He gave me the FBI manual, which I read, and taught myself the basics, an intro basic introduction to fingerprint science, all the terminology and the, and the process. So that I could spot any, if, if somebody came back and criticized or we started doing something wrong, I could catch it. Uh, so Larson is like me. He's a lay person who has studied it and, you know, they don't write this stuff for geniuses. It's like anything, car repair, any do-it-yourself project. Um, you can learn enough about this to, uh, not as easily as an expert with 10,000 hours of experience, but yeah, you can learn the basics of it and see uh, what they're talking about. So Larson continues, um, um, so it turns out Larson writes the conclusions uh, of both Darby and Garrett are correct. <laughs> Garrett just had erroneous prints. I plan on documenting what I've done when I find the time. Larson added that, quote, Garrett listed eight mismatches in the lifted print compared to the Navy provided print. All of those disappeared after he, Larson, reverted the alterations to the Navy print And that, the odds of that happening, because I'm seeing something in the Darby prints that were created as a result of low resolution copying, are astronomically slim. 
Larson realized something that is immediately obvious to anyone with an introductory knowledge of fingerprint science. That, quote, Garrett wasn't given the high quality photocopies that Darby had, unquote. He adds that, quote, there's nothing so, this is the quote I was telling you about, there's nothing so mysterious about fingerprint analysis that a layman can't understand it. It's like many other skills, carpentry for example, it takes time to become a craftsman, but understanding how things are built using lumber, nails, and screws takes nothing more than observation and common sense. He continues, if you look at the comparison of the latent print and the tin print, you see the matches uh, that the examiner found. This is what I did in 1998 when I was given um, a good copy of these prints for the purpose of scanning them and uh, to be used for the charts, the later charts. Um, I uh, immediately started trying to see how many of Darby's matches I could verify because I was not going to continue this if I couldn't. I, I didn't even have Darby's name at that time. I didn't care who the examiner was. All I cared about was, can I see this match? If I, if I could not see it, or if I could determine myself that it was not a match, I would have said, bye bar, bye Jay, count me out of this. Uh, do what you want, but I'm not gonna go through it. But the opposite happened. I could see the matches Darby made. From then on, it was solid to this day. Uh, it, it's a match. Uh, now, don't take my word for it, because I'm not an expert. You should take nobody's expert uh, opinion anyway. Uh, you should always think for yourself, which is what I did. But for me, uh, I had done my homework. It was done at that point, and to this day, I know that anyone who tries to attack it, uh, they're wrong. It's only a question to me is, how are they wrong? So I approach it from that point. Um, uh, and if you look at the, yeah, t and common sense. If you take a look at the uh, comparison of the latent and the temperate, Larson continues, and see the matches that an examiner found, you will understand right away that the exa what the examiner did. And you can do the same, just not as well as an experienced examiner. If I didn't believe that, I, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be planning to present to forum members my discovery of the apparent Navy print forgery. I fully expect that members will understand my presentation. Douglas Caddy, on October 12th, posted Mellon's reply. I'll read her entire reply. Quote, I am a firm believer in the First Amendment, which includes protection of lies. One print, however, should be corrected. Uh, one point, however, should be corrected, since there is not a shred of evidence as to its validity. That is, that the U.S. Navy fingerprints of Mac Wallace were altered or tampered with in any way. I did not request these prints of the Navy. I requested them from the National Archives, a uh, Mac Wallace military file. Included in that file, along with many other documents, were the fingerprints taken when Wallace joined the U.S. Marines uh, in 1939. Parentheses. J. Harrison never was able to access these prints. They were not floating around. They were part. Uh, they were not part of his files. Um, close paragraph. That these prints match the Austin prints um, were of the quote quote the same person unquote according to Robert Garrett is further evidence that the Navy prints were Mac Wallace's. Now you may have missed this. See how she confused. She got confused about what Larson said. Larson didn't say that the Navy prints were the ones floating around the internet. He said the prints alleged to be what Darby used for comparison were the low resolution ones. In reply to the point that the DPS print and the Navy print were matched to Garrett, matched by Garrett, Larson wrote, quote, that's right, the prints are identical, except for the alterations. <laughs> Adding, quote, the Austin print does match the WC box print. Darby failed to compare the Austin print with the high quality Warren Commission print from the box. Had he done so, he would have seen the match, unquote. Larson concluded that, quote, Garrett had what he needed to do the pertinent comparison, but he didn't do the pertinent comparison, unquote. Larson gave a more specific explanation of this by referring to Garrett's conclusions. 
uh, paragraph, quote, conclusions paragraph, which you can read in, the, in the Jones' book. Quote, not that it refers to the comparison of, of Austin low quality uh, photocopy, of the Austin low quality photocopy enlargement, which he calls D, and the WC latent low quality photocopy enlargement, which he calls E. Unfortunately, he doesn't call the Austin photocopy by the proper designation D, but rather by what he by what it was copied from, B. You'll see why when you read it. But you can tell by reading the preceding pages that he that the comparison was between D and E, not B and E. D and E are the low quality photocopies. Now, I know that's confusing, but I'm just putting it on record so that you can watch this later on YouTube and have the book in front of you. Larson continues, quote, Jones said the Austin prints weren't uh, usable. But that's only true if the flat set, of the flat set, according to Garrett. Okay, Larson is correct. There's nothing wrong with the quality of the DPS prints to be used for comparison. In fact, none of the examiners who have ever studied these prints, including those at the FBI, ever rejected the materials Darby used based on quality. There's an acronym for their analysis process. ACE-V stands for Analysis, Comparison, Evaluation, and Verification. The very first determination any CLPE makes is analysis. Assessing a print to determine if it can be used for a comparison. If the print is of inadequate quality, the examination ends there. Given Mellon's many errors and mistakes and facts and logic in this one chapter, I think Larson is on the right track. But I have not had the time to duplicate his efforts. And I um, but it's a time issue. Um, I have compared higher quality uh, reproductions of Darby's matches to Garrett's mismatches and have seen Garrett making different interpretations about the location of minutia Darby matched. And I have found Darby's interpretation to be more credible. I am therefore looking forward to Larson's published findings. I checked right before I came up for the speech and um, he hasn't published yet. Uh, uh, the thread uh, called something like Review of John Mellon's book uh, on the Education Problem is up to page 14. And for weeks and weeks now, I've been going back to page 14 and seeing if there was a next button. And I'll scroll down to the bottom and see if there's been any additions. Doug Caddy made some additions, but it hadn't proceeded beyond page 14. So I just checked and still no update. So we all look forward to Larson's published findings. One thing is certain, however. The Mellon Garrett reexamination is a classic case of junk science. Garbage in, garbage out is a capital mistake. Thank you. Hi, Edmund. All right. Uh, I don't think your mic is on. We got five minutes, so that's pretty good. Let me see if I can turn that mic on. Can you tell us what finger we're talking about? Hey, we have a question there. Can I tell you what finger we're talking about? Um, yeah, let me tell you that uh, the one print, that's a myth that there was only one print found. I tried to straighten that out two years ago, but I still see arguments online about the one print and even questions and debates about why, why did they only leave one print? So nobody's seen that speech from either Alexandria or uh, here two years ago. Um, if David Denton is around, uh, I want to request that he put my speech from Alexandria on YouTube, on their uh, JFK Historical Group site, so that people can see this. We'll make that happen. There, there were three fingers matched to four latents back in 1997. That's what my other speech was about. It was his left uh, ring finger, his left little finger, and his left thumb. And I studied the boxes. Uh, I did this once, and I haven't repeated it and reviewed it, 
but I have a memory that uh, I, I checked the Warren Commission exhibits on uh, the boxes we're talking about. Um, and yes, uh, if you lift a box, the pressure is going to be with the thumb and these latter fingers. So you even have a good argument with, for pressure. Um, and those are the fingers that would be involved. Uh, the reason it's three fingers with four latents is because Warren Commission tried to hide uh, one exhibit uh, as one print, but print, uh, print 22, Warren Commission's print 22, or FBI 22, is actually uh, two prints, and it includes a second impression of Wallace's little finger. Now in 1997, before Darby was ever brought into the scene, another examiner did the first match of all, of all three of these fingers on these four latents. On print 29, that was the best one, and he only got up to nine, um, he only got up to nine points of match. Um, I have been consulting with Barr about this uh, this weekend, and um, I asked, you know, who who was that first examiner? He doesn't re he doesn't remember either. This was something Jay did, uh, and Jay told me that another examiner examined it before Darby, um, uh, and he didn't want his name connected to it either after finding out that it was Wallace. Um, and so that's why, and I explained in that speech, that's why, that's why he went and got Darby, the best guy, he, the legend in the business. And um, so um, he um, he had another examiner. So we've got Hoffmeister, we got Darby, and we got the first guy who uh, actually didn't have, he didn't want his name connected, and it never did get connected. So good for him. Um, but uh, he made the first matches, and I, I was confused at the time when I gave that speech because I had conflated and thought that uh, Darby had started doing his matches in 97, in late 97, prior to October, because that's when I saw the first draft of Barr's manuscript. Um, and, I, and I showed those in my previous speech. Um, and. Um, but no, yeah, so now as of this weekend, I know that it wasn't Darby at least yet another example. Okay, uh, Richard and I go back about 30 years, and um, uh, and I'm glad to be partially responsible for his being here since I recruited him from Ale for Alexandria. Uh, you should go to Google, Richard Bartholomew, and check out his amazing manuscript about the rifle clip in the alleged Oswald rifle and what he did with that. Let me amend that. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of Richard Bartholomews, including a couple of famous ones. All right, well, if they put in rifle club plus, plus uh, and, and Richard Bartholomew JFK will get you all mine. And Walter yeah, Graff, uh, a guy. And if you can remember Walter, Walter, Walter Graff, Graff yeah. was my co-author on that. He was too elderly at the time. He was in his 80s. Uh, I knew Walter for 40 years. He used to take my course. He's a terrific fellow. But there was a time when he could have written that paper. Yes. He was a paralegal for much of his life. And he also has a manuscript that makes reference to the station wagon in Dealey Plaza. And he's, but more importantly, he goes into all of the Texas connections way back then, and he was right on the money. This man is one of those patriots that I make reference to. Thank you. A couple of quick things. Uh, I'm doing this from memory. But I was also got a hold of the Hoffmeister documentation, and uh, as I recall, he did a blind test on the on the print, and then he was told it was Malcolm Wallace. Mellon says that you know uh, Malcolm Wallace, other than killing one guy, was a, a fine guy, um, <laughs> and, and, and and called his son to get him to. Yeah, well, I talked about that yesterday. But the important thing is that from memory, if I recall correctly, Hoffmeister's wife, I believe, was wheelchair bound. And I think she worked in the Texas area. And when she came home and he said, I have identified this print and it's Malcolm Wallace's. And he didn't know who Malcolm Wallace is as far as I know. And she knew. And she said to him, do you know who Malcolm Wallace is? You're going to go, you're going to get killed. And then what's going to happen to me? So I think it's, I think it's important to get that dramatic part of it out. And what, it is important to emphasize that. I'm glad you brought that up yeah. because, as Jay told me, it was his wife yes. who was scared to death. Yes. And one more thing. I told this to Billy Celestes on the phone. And we were talking about Lyndon Johnson and, and his power. And Billy said to me, and I was telling him about Hoffmeister backing out. 
And Billy said to me, Ed, talking about Lyndon Johnson, he said, Ed, that Texas act, Ed, people are afraid of him dead. Okay? Um, we also have, you mentioned Sebastian Latona, the FBI finger, fingerprint or print expert. And I just wanted to, a little aside, there was a, I know I'm time wise, but I'll be quick. Uh, the, uh, the rifle was in possession of the, text, of the Dallas police, and they sent it up to the FBI, and then they sent it back. And when they sent it back the second time, uh, uh, this Lieutenant J John Kyle Dale said he found inside the rifle a palm print and said it was Oswald's palm print. And then the rifle was sent back to Latona. And Latona opened it up and said, there's no palm print here. And they said, well, when we lifted the palm print, it took it off the rifle. Yeah. And Latona said, and this is in a Warren Commission document that's buried, <laughs> and no, almost no one knows about it, and Latona said, that when you do that, it leaves a residue of the stuff he used to lift the print, and there's no residue here. Right. So here's an FBI expert who's defying Hoover, saying, I think this is all. I think they, they, we're running late enough, and we're going to move along. Come over and talk to me with your questions. It's much more important. One last point. Um, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Okay. Uh, Roger Stone is speaking tomorrow. He's a controversial figure, yeah. but he says he has a fingerprint expert who's looked at this, and, and his fingerprint expert is saying it is, it is Malcolm Wallace's print. So I don't know. You ask him about that. Roger Stone will be talking about a fingerprint expert that he um, got to take a look at this and says it's Malcolm Wallace's print. Let me also add that I, I became aware that Sherry Kleister. Um, had a fingerprint expert look at it in New Orleans and determined that it was not Malcolm Wallace's print. But we have not seen any details of any of this. So I would urge Sherry Kleister to release uh, her print examiner's findings if indeed that's not just a rumor. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Bartholomew. Next up, lunch. So if you would, rejoin us at 12.45 for the remainder of our program. Enjoy your lunch.